Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky. Stormy weather since my Lord and I aren't together. Since I'm all alone in this storm. That'll work. About, um, gosh, almost 17 years ago, I was minding my business down in Charleston, South Carolina. I was a pastor of a, a beautiful church on the Sea Islands, Kiowa and Seabrook. And we were the, we were the last church till Bermuda. And I always loved that. I put up a sign that said that, last church till Bermuda. But I got a phone call one afternoon. I was kind of burning out on being a pastor. I've been doing it for 22 years on and off serving in the Navy um, as a chaplain. And I got a call from the Navy in uh, 2007 asking me if I would be part of medical teams that um, were going to work with our Navy and Marines who were going to Iraq and Afghanistan to serve with the Army. And not many people know that we literally uh, put thousands of sailors into Army uniforms and sent them into the desert. Now, I was 50 years old by that time, and I had served in the Navy for 22 years, so I wasn't a kid anymore. So I was a little more bold than maybe I would have been as, a, as an 18 or 20-year-old. And I noticed that the chaplain was sort of a rabbit's foot. You know, oh, chaps, you know, we got serious stuff to do here. Just uh, let people know you're, you're uh, available if they need you. And I saw this dynamic going on time and time again where they'd say to me, chaps, you can't make a difference for these 10,000 sailors going forward. You can't make a difference, chaps. And I'd talk to them about, but they need hope. And they'd say, chaplain, hope is not a strategy. So I thought, you know who I need to minister to? I need to minister to these medical people. They were Navy medical people working with the Marines. And I need to share with them that they really can make a difference. So I told this story, and it's one you probably know, but it's a story of a starfish. Q starfish. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> So growing up or, or being a, a pastor on the Sea Islands, and yeah, I'm used to this. But you know, when it becomes low tide and those starfish are lying there, they die. They dry out and they die. And so there was a little boy down at the, the sea on the shore and he's reaching down and he's picking up starfish and he's throwing them back in one at a time over and over. And there are literally hundreds of starfish all along the shore. And someone like me, an old guy who thinks he knows everything, comes up to the kid and says, Hey, kid, there's hundreds of starfish. You can't make a difference. Little kid looks him in the eye, looks down, grabs a starfish, throws it back in there and says, I made a difference for that one. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, because it's no secret that we're living in a storm. You know, I, I went away to, to those wars because we were going to take the war to the enemy. We were going to take the fight to where the fight was in the Middle East. Well, guess what? I stand here today to tell you the fight came back with me. And now people are killing people all over the place in our country. I call it a pandemic of fear. I believe the storm we're living in now, I'm preaching now. Somebody say amen. 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 We're living in a pandemic of fear. We're surrounded by fearful people. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go. And that is the only power. I don't know what you believe about, you know. The Irish have a tradition that you never name Satan. You never name, you say, the old boy. So whatever you think of evil, I don't have to convince you that there is evil that has been unleashed in a way that we have not seen evil before. A pandemic of fear. 
But the only power that evil has is to convince you and me that we can't make a difference. That it doesn't matter if you come to church. That it doesn't matter if you pray. That everybody's corrupt. You can't make a difference. Doubt. Indifference. And this feeling of dread and doom. Where does that come from? It comes from the old boy. It comes from evil. The father of lies. The Lord of the flies. It smells bad. You know what it smells like and looks like. Don't tell me you don't know what evil is. Don't tell me you can't see the old boy at work. So I come through that door back there and I proudly sit in that back pew unless Raul kicks me out. And I love it in the back. I'll tell you, it, being, being doing this for 30 some years, it's so nice sitting in the back. I get up and get coffee during the noisy offering. <laughs> One time I went back there and Bishop Gary was having a party set. I let, I let his family in. We hung out and had coffee. I never miss a sermon. I always make communion. But if you see, it's a, such a luxury. But you know, I'll come in this church. I'll, I'll come around that lion over there because I always park over there. I initially parked over there in case I didn't want to stay. And the first Sunday I came, it was holy hilarity. And I, thought, <laughs> and I brought a Navy chaplain friend with me, another Episcopal priest, and he said, you, you can never leave this church. <laughs> and I never did. <laughs> But I still park over there and I come through and I swear to God that there have been times when I've been surrounded by that nastiness of the world. And I've come in here and I haven't said this since I was a, a four-year-old Roman Catholic kid in the cry room. This is my happy place. It was so fun to talk to Bishop Gary's kids and grandkids and it was so nice to be here and listen to Bill and see the Holy Spirit moving right up here. There's an activity up here that I can see. And I, I don't have great discernment of spirits, but when I see the Holy Spirit moving, boy, that brings me joy. So here we are at First Lutheran. Take a look up at that ceiling. You know why they built churches like this? To look like a boat. That's to look like a keel of a ship. And a lot of churches are built that way. To remind us that we're in the boat together. We're in that boat. You and I are the disciples in that boat. We are that story. And I don't know about you, but I think it takes a lot of faith in my life to look up and say, Jesus, wake up. I'm perishing. What's the matter with you, Jesus? And what is Jesus' response to us? Pat, wake up. First Lutheran Church, wake up. One of my struggles has been I, I train people going forward how to calm themselves down, how to be focused, how to be one and connect with their God and their faith because they were going into battle. They were going into war. And now I'm back many years and I realize that you, when you leave this building, are going into a place of battle, a place of a lot of fear, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. And you need to be prepared. We need to encourage one another to be still and calm ourselves. To be still and calm ourselves. How do we practice peace? I want to leave you with something today. How do you, do you have a practice? I mean, do you say prayers before you eat? Do you pray before you go to bed? Do you do yoga? Do you meditate? Do you do music? How do you practice your faith? Because you need to be as sharp as any warrior going into combat. And the world needs First Lutheran and you that are here now. It's funny. One of my pains was to retire and no longer be in the Navy. And to retire and no longer be a pastor. 
And Bill can tell you, I've done a lot of spinning my wheels. What can I do? How can I make a difference? Right? Made a difference for that one. But I didn't feel like I was. And I'm looking back at my life, and maybe I didn't do anything. Maybe I made no difference. Anybody ever feel that way? What does God say to Job? Job? Pat? Where were you when I built the foundations of the world? Guess what? You want to be an instrument for peace? Here's the first thing, maybe the last thing you ever need to know. You and I are not God. We're not in control. That's the most powerful thing that we can do is know that. And I want to tell you, I learned this from a professor of mine, but it really speaks volumes today. The opposite of love is not hate. And let me, let me be really clear about this, because this is really important. The opposite of love is fear. If you can get this, then you can have compassion in a world that's filled with hate. Do you understand? Somebody say amen. Amen? Okay, you got to get this. That person, listen, the worst place, and I drive in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The worst place to drive is US 31 from Holton Road to 96. <laughs> now they're passing me on the right, and I try to get in the left lane as soon as possible. Well, Pat, who thinks he's God, wants to instruct everybody, of course. If I can see that, what looks to me to be anger at me maybe not getting out of the lane fast enough, and I do not drive in the left lane. I do not. But I can't even move fast enough for that truck that's on my rear in the right lane because they're going to go on the exit. That person is not angry. It's just displaying as anger. They're not hateful me because I'm slow. Oh, I saw a bumper sticker <laughs> on a guy's car at the gas station. The bumper sticker said, the, the, though the closer you get, the slower I go. <laughs> I thought that was perfect. And I, I, I asked him, you know, I, I thought, boy, oh boy, that, you know, you put that on your bumper sticker, you're going to get some. So if we can realize that Aunt Betty who we're no longer talking to because she believes in a conspiracy theory and believes in Jewish space lasers, if you will. Name the theory. And you can barely talk to your relatives. If you realize that they're not angry, they're not hateful, they're afraid. How many times in the Bible does Jesus say, be not afraid? Why? So you can have peace in a world that is filled with fear. Be not afraid. So I saw the troops. I saw the Navy and Marines. A lot of them reservists like myself going forward for the first time into combat zones. And some of them got so wound up that they had to slow their breathing down by using a paper bag. You know about that? If somebody's going to pass out. So it came to this chaplain. Why don't I teach him? I've studied Zen for a long time. Why don't I teach him a breathing technique? You want to know the easiest way to bring peace into your life is to be aware of your breath. Huh. Christians say, drop down in your spirit. You're more solid there. So what I want to do with you today is I'm going to teach you three short breaths. So the next time Aunt Betty or someone on US 31 or someone in the grocery store or someone you know that is just acting out, you're going to be able to stop and pause. And I don't mean just breathe. This is not silly stuff, okay? I had a group of... Uh, I had a group of... Um, Navy SEALs that were giggling in the back when I gave this talk. They were giggling. What are you giggling about? Oh, chaplain, what does breathing have to do with combat? <laughs> well, a heck of a lot, it turns out. They came back and thanked me afterwards. Now, 
separation of church and state. I believe in it. I could not stand in front of people that were ordered to listen to me and tell them to pray. You understand that? That's illegal, and I, it should be illegal. But I can stand in front of a group of 500 people and ask them to breathe, right? The lawyer followed me, so I knew it. So I'm going to teach you this. It's just three breaths. Next time you're in a grocery store, next time you walk through a doorway, next time you get in the car and sit, take three seconds, three breaths. I get this from uh, Richard Rohr, and it's the word Yahweh. He says, it'll be your first and your last breath. Yahweh. Yahweh. Way. And the key here is you fill up your diaphragm like a balloon and it never sinks in. You call it belly breathing. It's actually your diaphragm. So I want to just do this as a group and watch the atmosphere of this room literally change when we do that together right now. Breathe in from your big toe, okay? Breathe in from your big toe, all the way up. Fill up like a balloon, yah, and then breathe out. And when you breathe out, way, breathe out the junk that's in your brain. Breathe out the thing you came here with that's bugging the heck out of you. Let it go, and you'll find peace. You ready? Here we go. Sit up straight now. Okay, let's all go together. Ready? Yah. Way. 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 Now listen. Listen. You hear that? That's peace. That's stillness. And that'll take you anywhere you want to go. And if you're in line at Meyer, somebody says, what are you saying? You say, Yahweh, get it? Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay, I'm done. Give me the hook. There we go. <laughs> Precious Lord, take my hand. Please stand.